Well, you know, part of the you know, part of the issue is that, you know, the way we're taught in classes oftentimes is you hear a problem, you diagnose it, you prescribe a prescription and, you know, and, but yeah, rehearsing is so, it, it's, it's a lot of that, sure, but it's so much more. And one of the things, I mean, I could, I could tell this to you and then just hang up and feel like I've done a good job. You wouldn't be very happy with me, but I think I think what's so important for younger conductors this could be this may be the most important thing that I could say to younger conductors is always find a musical reason to make the technique better so that technique and technical issues will always serve the music because perfection there is no such thing as perfection and at some point in your life, you have to give that up and you just, you have to focus on the essence of the music. And that's, that's a real tightrope. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the good fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. Are you planning to travel with your group sometime soon? If so, please consider my sponsor, Kaleidoscope Adventures, a full-service tour company specializing in student group travel. With a former educator as its CEO, Kaleidoscope Adventures is dedicated to changing student lives through travel, and they offer high-quality service and an attention to detail that comes from more than 25 years of student travel experience. Trust Kaleidoscope's outstanding staff to focus on your group's one-of-a-kind adventure so that you can focus on everything else. The Everything Band Podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio-on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you knew one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to my next guest, Craig Kirchhoff. Hi, Craig. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? Well, I'm very good. I'm uh, sequestered in northern Minnesota uh, at our lake cabin, which is uh, about 44 miles north of uh, Lake Superior. And uh, as I look out my front window, I look at the ridge here, and that is Canada. Wow. Yeah, so we're in the middle of the coronavirus um, social distancing lockdown, however it's being called in your region, phenomena here in the middle of April. And so um, I know it's really cold right now in St. Louis. Is it cold up there right now? Yeah, it was very cold today. I mean, uh, we had a fall last week, and uh, it and it snowed on and off all day today, but it never got above thirty degrees. So you know, for this time of the year, that's pretty cool. Yeah, do you, is that usually your summer? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're up here as much as we can, and uh, but we're both busy, so you know, we'd like to spend more time, but. Uh, Maybe that's what makes it uh, very special for us is that uh, we're not up here the whole time. And and actually, the wintertime is the most beautiful time to be up here. Plus, there are no bugs, Yeah, that's which nice. is a big bonus, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, we are here to talk about your career and about band, so we should get on to that. So could you do me a favor and introduce yourself for my listeners? Sure. I'm Craig Kirchhoff, and uh, I stepped down as director of bands at the University of Minnesota in April of... 2015, and then I decided uh, to do a three-year phased retirement, uh, not as director of bands, but I wanted to go back into undergraduate teaching, uh, so I taught uh, the undergraduate conducting course, and I also taught a graduate course called Conducting for Non-Conducting Majors, and uh, what was interesting about that is, you know, we had a lot of graduate students in instrumental studies or composers or pianists, 
you know, that just felt that uh, they needed to learn how to connect better, to, uh, just and also to fill out their dossier a little bit more. So those are the two courses I taught for three years. And uh, so I've been retired full time now for the past two years. And uh, I call it job adjustments. It's not really retirement. I'm just busy doing other things, but not working at the university. Yeah, that's really interesting. I When I was a doctoral student getting a comp- composition degree, I took that exact same course with um, uh, with Jim Croft at Florida State. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I, I, I know what that class looks like or feels like. I, I can imagine that one. So that was a fun yeah, class. Well, Jim Croft was one of the great – he's one of my heroes. I mean, we became very, very dear friends, and, uh, you know, he and his wife were just uh, – very, very special people. So you were just fortunate that you had that time with him. I know, just to have that that opportunity. Yeah, Jim was the real deal. And, you know, he he had this unbelievable high school band program in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And uh, so Oshkosh, Wisconsin is, you know, in the, somewhat in the middle of the state. And here he's programming in the Miss Symphony and other pieces. And uh and doing great work there and, and and really in a sense reaching out to his audiences and teaching them about music and exposing them to great music and then of course he went to South Florida and then eventually ended up at uh, Florida State. But he uh yeah, he's one if there was a you know, uh Mount Rushmore for conductors, Jim would certainly be up on that mountain. Yeah. So can you tell me, Craig, about your origin story? How did you get into music in, in the early days? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think that when I was a very young kid, I, you know, um, being German and living in Milwaukee and uh, uh, being Lutheran, um, our church had a r- very terrific music program with a terrific organist and for some reason which I can't explain to you I somehow fell in love with Bach and I fell in love with with the organ as an instrument I was just amazed by the power of the instrument the dexterity of the instrument and so that's what I really wanted to do I wanted to become an organist but but um you know my family with five children we we just couldn't afford a piano and so when fifth grade rolled around, um, that was that was the uh, time in Milwaukee where, you know, students signed up for instruments. And I had a very, very good friend in fifth grade who, and we still remain good friends and stay in touch. His name is Rick Aaron. And Rick and I just, on a whim, decided, let's play flute. And, uh, you know, we we started out in... in uh, you know, class lessons in the Milwaukee public schools. And then we eventually uh, left that and found a private teacher that we could go to. And we would ride on the bus together to her house to take lessons. And uh, and so we, in a sense, followed each other around for a long, long time. But that's that's how I started playing. I It was, it was just, you know, a very uh, it was a whimsical decision. But it had a big impact on my life. How about some teachers, early teachers that may have influenced you? Well, I was very fortunate. I I went to um, a school called John Marshall Junior Senior High School. And uh, at that point, um, that was the largest single school building in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, there were close to 3,000 students in that school. And it meant that that's where I spent six years of my educational life. And I had the same band director for all of those years. His name was Michael Yindra. And it was, it was, you know, all of the stars lined up and he just took a real interest in me. And, um, he was a great teacher. Uh, he was tough as nails, but he was a great teacher and gave me wonderful opportunities and encouraged me to go to, you know, summer music camps. And that's where I actually started conducting as a, you know, as an eighth grade, eighth grader in the Shorewood High School summer music camp. But he was, he was very encouraging. And he, it was, although 
I mean, as I look back at it, I'm sure that I, I wasn't aware of what was happening at the time, but he, he knew how to teach and he knew how to get great results out of high school students. And he also really knew the repertoire. I can, I can still remember doing pieces like the Holtz for Suites and American Salutes and, and, uh, Tower Symphony of Wagner and, and, uh, and I didn't know it at the time how lucky I was, but I spent all that time with him, and so he is my musical hero. He's the one that really influenced me as a, you know, as a young musician. So uh, the first question I have that comes out of that is, what was that opportunity to conduct in eighth grade? How did that come about? Oh, it was just a it was just a class as a part of the. Uh, uh, summer music camp at Shore High School, and so we learned all the patterns, and we had to, uh, you know, we had to conduct a national anthem with all the, you know, fermatas and different kinds of scissors, and that's what kind of got me started. And, you know, in, in a sense, I, I mean, physical conducting for me was, although I didn't know what I was really doing, but but going through the patterns, doing all of that was not difficult for me. So when I was in high school, I actually became my, you know, the high school marching band's drum major for two years. And of course that was a lot of conducting. And, uh, so it was just something that I enjoyed doing and, uh, and, uh, enjoyed leading other people. But, uh, that was all the result of his influence over me and pushing me. So wh- at what point do you think you knew that you wanted to be a professional musician or a teacher? When, when did that come about? Well, you know, there were there were certain experiences that I had in high school. Um, first of all, it was a wonderful band program, and uh, but again, Mr. Yinder encouraged me to get involved in this program called Music for Youth, and uh, which uh, met uh, ensembles met at the uh, Milwaukee Art Museum. And I can still remember, I can still see the room. The first time I played with the pop music for youth orchestra, and I still to this day don't know how I got into that group because almost all the wind players and all the string players were college students. And I can remember, I don't remember the piece that we, the first piece that I played with them, but I remember I couldn't play because I just had never heard sounds like that. I mean, we had a good orchestra back at school, but I had never heard sounds like that coming from the back of the orchestra. And, you know, that was a, it was a, it was just a wonderful enriching program for me. And one of the wonderful parts of that is that the choral conductor for the choral component of that was Margaret Hawkins, who used to teach out of Milwaukee high school. And, and so we used to do all the big choral works choral and orchestra or choral and wind works and you know mozart requiem and bach b minor mass and and it was those experiences or the same matthew passion i think the same matthew passion was the piece it starts with that old with that opening double fugue and i just couldn't play i just had never heard music like that and i think i think that was the start so that's what got me hooked. And uh, and there were all kinds of experiences like that. So I was very fortunate as a high school student to be exposed to really great music with really great musicians at a at a younger age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, that having that peak, moment, that peak moment, you know, as they call them, where you fall in love with music, I think that that sustains a lot of people through this profession. Yeah, it does. And and you can't forget that moment. And sometimes it's it's easy to forget that moment in our busy lives with everything that we have to do. But sometimes we have to go back to our very beginnings and uh, remember what that felt like. But as I said, I can still remember sitting in the balcony of that church, you know, playing the opening of that St. Matthew Passion. And I, I literally couldn't play. I tried <laughs> and I, I just couldn't play. I just, I was so moved by it. And, uh, till this day, I, I can still see Milton Weber up there conducting and, uh, I can see the church and I can still hear those sounds. And it was a, you know, it was a transformative moment mm-hmm. for me. 
Yeah, I imagine every listener right now is like imagining that moment for themselves. I know I certainly was as you were saying that. You know, it's it's a remarkable feeling. And of course, it, we have it over and over again that keeps us going. I often think about it like, I don't know if you play golf, but like when you hit that perfect golf shot and then the next 10 are bad, you always remember that yeah. good one. Yeah, <laughs> it that's a, keeps oh, you going. It's a good one that keeps coming, making you come back. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, how about college? Where did you end up going and what was that experience? Well, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, which was a great school. Um, the Fine Arts Wilbur Quintet was in residence there. The Fine Arts String Quartet, the world famous string quartet, was in residence there. And it, it was just a, a, a terrific school when I was there. I mean, with very gifted students. John Downey was the composer um, in residence on campus who had studied with Boulanger and had got his doctorate at the French Conservatory. And yeah, it, it, you know, so it was being p- around people like that that was inspiring. And I had this dream as a flute player that I wanted to be, you know, uh, the dream was I wanted to be principal flute in the Berlin Philharmonic. Well, Something in the back of mind said, of my mind said, you know, that's probably not going to work out. And so, because of Mr. Yindra, my band high school and, and junior high school band director, um, I thought, well, I can I can double major, and I'll have to go to, go to school every summer. But I'm going to get my performance degree and get my music education degree, and that's and that's what I did. And. Um, you know, it was a lot of work, as you can well imagine. But uh, and then in the summers, uh, the New York Woven Quintet, people like Sam Samuel Barron and uh, Arthur Weisberg, you, you know, came were in residence, and I got to study with them in the summer. So again, it was just a very it was just the intersection and the stars lining up that I had the opportunity to, to spend with you know time with people like that. So now did you get, uh, uh, you got the double major. I assume you're talking performance and education. Yeah. And so did you teach after your degree or did you go into graduate school? No, I taught. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I went to school in the Milwaukee public school, so it was logical for me to, and that was a great school system back in those days, just a great school system and uh, that supported music in ways that most school systems didn't at that point in Wisconsin. But uh, my first job um, was uh, I was the, became the band director at Wells Junior High School, which at that point in 1971 was the most transient inner city school, middle school. And um, so that was an experience that was eye-opening for me because, you know, as a student, you know, I, it, was, it was difficult for me to understand because of, you know, where I lived and what I did to understand the trials and tribulations of students dealing with their own lives in an inner city school. But uh, my responsibility was to, they, they didn't have a band there, and my responsibility was to start a band. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in February, I was called to service in the uh, you know, United, United States Army Reserve Band and went on active duty for four years, uh, excuse me, four months. But when I came back from active duty in June of uh, 1972, I was assigned, believe it or not, to my old junior, senior high school. Oh, wow. So I taught where I went to school, which was, uh, an interesting experience on so many levels. And so I was very fortunate to inherit this great band program, which Mr. Yindre had developed and, uh, and, uh, Back in those days, I mean, there were, I think at its peak, there may have been 320 students in the band program, and it was just me. So we had two seventh grade bands, two eighth grade bands, an intermediate band, 
and then the symphonic band, and I also did the jazz ensemble. So I was a busy guy, but uh, so but I loved it. I I discovered that I really loved teaching, and again, these were great students. And uh, one of the benefits of teaching in the, in the Milwaukee public school system is that is that the system had a series of uh, five locations in the city where every Saturday morning, if students could not afford private lessons, they could go to one of these centers and take 16 class lessons on, sa- on Saturday mornings. And if you just took class lessons, the fee was $2. So 16 lessons for $2. If you rented an instrument and took those class lessons, it was three dollars and fifty cents. So, I mean, which of course, by today's standards, is ludicrous. But that's what it was back in those days. So, all of my students were studying. They were studying their instruments, and um, and of course, that eventually went to the wayside later on. But um, for me, it was it was an amazing experience, and. Um, I loved it. I was like a pig in mud. I just thought, this is how I want to spend the rest of my life. And the facility was terrific, and the support was terrific. And uh, and then uh, then my life changed a bit. Yeah. Can I before we go on to that? Can I dig in a little bit to the, your uh, teaching? Okay. So you mentioned that you um, that you were re- uh, called to the military service. Was that the draft for the Vietnam War? Uh, yeah. I what I did is. Um, I decided to join the 84th Division United States Army Reserve Band, and I did that because, at the advice of a couple friends of mine, um, people like Stan Arusha and and others, but also the younger younger members of the Milwaukee Symphony were doing the same thing, and it was either do that and serve your country that way for six years, or it was the great fear of getting drafted and. Uh, so we did that together for six, six years, and that was another good experience of being together with really good musicians. So that's how that that started. I see. Such a different time. P- young, you know, young people today can't imagine that. I guess. No, and I I can still remember the incredible pressure that everybody felt. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you you know if you didn't accomplish, if you didn't pass your fifteen credits for the semester. I mean, it was a real liability in terms of the draft board. And now those are hard times, hard times. I mean, I was, I was born that year. I was born in 71. So, you know, I, I, I remember the echoes of that era, you know, in my family, but not certainly don't remember that era, if that makes sense. Yeah, but it was real. I mean, it was, um, uh, I can remember myself and, but other friends who were, terrified of taking this music history exam because they knew if they didn't pass this exam, they weren't going to pass the course and that that had consequences. Yeah. That certainly is motivation to study boy. Yeah, it certainly is. So you mentioned that you were asked to start a band program before you left. And I know that you didn't have that opportunity to kind of follow through with that, but you know, it makes me think about a question that some people face. If you had to start a band program, what would be a couple things that you would want to have in place? Mm, that's a good, very good question. Uh, I, I think one of the things in an ideal world, in a perfect world, is I think the students have to have access to really good teachers. And I think there's different ways to do that. Um, my wife, Liz, who, as I mentioned before, teaches at Eden Prairie High School, uh, she taught at the university for three years. And she worked very closely with one of the uh, outer, you know, fringe winds of of inner city schools. Um, It was a high school, Brooklyn Center High School, but she created a mentorship program between her music education majors and those students. So the music education majors went out to the schools and actually mentored those students and it was a very special experience for our music education majors to have that kind of experience and it meant the world to those students to 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 be able to play an instrument and and to be able to have lessons so i think having having access to teachers and it doesn't need to be 
people from the symphony. It could be, I mean, there's all kinds of creative ways to solve that. And of course, the challenge is, is finding ways to find good instruments for them to use, because that's oftentimes that's the big impediment. But I think that the other thing is, and I wish I would have spent or devoted more time in all of my methods courses, really learning the instruments and really being able to teach the instruments. And, you know, when I went to school, um, you know, we had to take fundamentals of trumpet, fundamentals of trombone. I mean, we had to take, you know, fundamentals of violin and uh, uh, clarinet. All of, I mean, we, we studied all of the instruments. And now, of course, because curriculums are compacted, now we have to teach those like a brass methods course for a semester that covers all the instruments or a woodwind methods course or a percussion methods course. But... I I think if I had to start all all over again, just knowing those instruments, knowing how to teach those instruments is just so, so important. And, you know, we're just not able to give our students the, the amount of curriculum that deals with that. So students have to be really motivated if they're going to start a band program or work with beginning students to make sure that they can actually play the instrument and they understand the problems of the instrument. So it's a big challenge in today's educational world. Oh, I think so. I, you know, it's, I think it's one of those things, though, you learn so much on the job. I know when I came back to teaching band after so many years away, I had to relearn a lot of things about playing instruments, you know, the various. I mean, I couldn't remember my, my pinky keys on the clarinet. I had to remember that. Yeah, stuff. exactly. You know, I had to the, yeah, and because, you know, you forget all of that. Sure, sure. I mean, you know how it works, but you forget the details. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I um, it's really interesting. My wife teaches cello at a university here, and she has string methods this semester. And they split the course. They do the the violin and viola is the first eight weeks, and then the cello and the bass is the last eight weeks. And um, mm-hmm. the the they all turned in their violins, and they were going to pick up their cello cellos on the Monday, and then school was closed. So she's teaching this course, and none of the kids have a cello. Yeah. And so yeah. we just talked about this at dinner. They're going to learn on the job. They're going to learn in the moment. Well, the reality is, I think, is that, you know, regardless of where you go to school, um, there's no school in the country or the world that can prepare you to really do the job that you need to do. And and that's why um, I think that uh, experience is so important and you know, one of the things that I insisted on when I was teaching graduate programs at Ohio State and uh, at, at the University of Minnesota was that I would not accept um, students for study in the conducting program at the master's level uh, unless they had at least three years of experience and and more experience um, for the doctorate because that that experience is more critical in a way than, than their entire undergraduate, you know, programs. That's where you really learn the business and you find out what you don't know. And then you figure out ways to, to get that information. Mm -hmm. Did you um, experience as the real teacher? Did you have mentors when you were teaching? Did you have anyone that you remember? Yeah, I, I, my, my, yeah, I did actually. Um, There were two people who were very influential, and they were supervisors in the Milwaukee public school system. Uh, One was Dan Ferrari, and the other one was Sam Holdorf. And they were very good mentors for me. And also, the, the other person who was a huge influence for me also who was a supervisor and who supervised the orchestral uh, activities in the Milwaukee public schools was Bernard Stepner, who was a brilliant man, a terrific conductor, terrific musician. So those three people, again, were very influential in those next four years of my career as a high school teacher. They stayed in touch, came to rehearsals, made suggestions, 
So it was that kind of a relationship, and uh, I welcomed that and, and uh, probably didn't appreciate it like I should have at the time. But uh, as I look back now, I realize how important those three people were to my musical life. Yeah, this is, this is interesting, but I know we have almost the rest of the story is the bigger part. So we should probably talk about um, what happened next after your high school gig. Well, what happened was, Mark, is that I, uh, I had fully intended to continue doing what I was doing. Um, I was, I was active professionally as a flute player. I, uh, um, was principal in the ballet orchestra and at times played in the opera orchestra and every once in a while I was fortunate enough to play, uh, uh, extra in the Milwaukee symphony. So I was like living the, living the life, you know, teaching during the day. I mean, I was busy, but, uh, and then doing high level playing, um, you know, during the time that I was a high school band director, and I thought, well, this is this is how I want to live my life. Maybe not this busy, but well, then something happened. The same gentleman, Rick Aaron, who I believe it or not, who I started, you know, flute class in fifth grade, called me, and he was living in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, Rick called and said, "Look, I'm I'm playing in this." laboratory band, the symposium band, uh, and there's all these conductors who are here, and Frederick Fennell is the master teacher. And of course, I knew who Frederick Fennell was, and I thought, well, that'll be fun, and of course, I just love playing, and I love being with Rick. So little did I know that that car ride up to Madison and that experience there was, was going to change my life, and what happened was... I, you know, sitting down and playing in that ensemble and watching Fred work with those conductors and then watching him conduct and sensing what he was giving to the ensemble. And of course, every score he did, he did by memory, which completely blew me away. At that point in my life, I suddenly realized I really don't know anything about conducting. I mean, my head was like the exorcist was spinning around 360 degrees, trying to figure out how does this man elicit this kind of musical response for this ensemble? So then all of a sudden, you know, I realized I have to learn more about this. And that's what started yeah, my path to uh, going to graduate school. And at that time, Bob Reynolds was the director of bands at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, or Madison, excuse me. And some of my close friends were studying with him or studied with him, and they all told me this is the place to study. So I, in the fall of 1974, I went up to audition for Bob. He accepted me for study. And I saw him at a concert in Milwaukee, and he turned around and looked at me. And he said, have you quit your job yet? <laughs> and I knew something was up. And that, that, of course, is the time when he was in the process of moving from Wisconsin to Michigan. And uh, he had no assistantships open at the University of Michigan, and I just couldn't afford to pay you know, out-of-state graduate tuition there. So I stayed at the University of Wisconsin, and my teacher of record, actually, is Eugene Corpine. And so what happened is they really didn't replace Bob. They just moved Gene up, and Eugene conducted the wind ensemble. And then I was given the responsibility of conducting the symphonic band um, the first semester and then the university band the second semester. And I had never conducted players like this. I mean, I just felt like I was a half inch ahead of them on everything. I mean, talk about growth, you know, by fire. That was it. Um, so although, you know, I never studied with Bob, something I, I still in my own way regret today, uh, being there with Eugene and having those kinds of experiences was again, uh, life changing. And then the other thing that happened was I think to, uh, help, uh, the graduate conducting program, 
brought in Frederick Fennell for eight weeks throughout the year. And that's where I really got to know Dr. Fennell. And, uh, and uh, my, my feelings about his teaching and his music making and his incredible fidelity to score study was the same as when I first met him. And uh, so that was the start of a long and wonderful and fruitful relationship um, that went on for until he passed away. Yeah, you mentioned the Mount Rushmore of conductors earlier. I think Fred Fennell would be front and center. Oh, there, no doubt about that. And and what Fred had, he had this ability to get people to play a certain way, which if you would ask him about it, he could never explain it, or never. But it was it was um, it was magical, absolutely magical. And when you take that ability, which is an intangible, and then you connect it to his his understanding of music, his understanding of theory, his, his understanding of uh, music history, it was it was just it was charismatic every minute on that podium. And um, and I knew that I couldn't. One of the things I learned very on, you know very early on is, and I I tried it. For about two weeks, and I realized this is not working. I thought, well, if I conduct just like Fred, I'll be like Fred. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that didn't work for my students. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, my students asked me, is there something wrong with you? Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> we can't ever be someone we're not. No, no. You, and you can't escape who you are. But he provided the inspiration to figure out how to make meaningful and transformative music making. And uh, he gave his last concert, actually, um, on the stage of uh, Ted Mann Concert Hall at the University of Minnesota. One of his favorite pieces was, uh, it's the variations on the Parazzi theme uh, of Richard Wagner that Alfred Reed said. And it doesn't sound like Alfred Reed, it, it sounds like Wagner. And I was standing behind stage looking through the uh, sound panels and he starts this thing. He's 92 years old and I'm standing back there saying, how does he get those sounds? He just had, there was something about what was on the inside of him and there was something about his way to convey that was mesmerizing. And um, so that's, that's, that was his inspiration to me. That was his gift to me. And, uh, and I'll never forget my time with him. And, you know, I was very fortunate. He thought enough of me that he suggested to the Tokyo Kosei Wun Orchestra that maybe I would be a good choice of conductor to come when he, you know, came back to the United States. Uh, he always came back to the States for about three months but spent the rest of the year there. And so that's how I, that's how I started that journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's so much to unpack here, Craig. <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of good, good ways, directions we can go. I guess we should finish your story though, as far as, um, so you were at, um, Washington state and Ohio state before you ended up back in Minnesota. Yeah, I was excellent. Excellent. So, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I, you know, I loved, I love teaching out of Washington State uh, because I just love that part of the country. I mean, every every morning was getting up and and just looking around you and being inspired by nature and the beauty of the landscape. And um, so I was very, very again, very, very happy there. And then what happened was Bob Reynolds called me one day, and you know, Bob has become such a great supporter and mentor to me, and one of my best friends now, said to me when I was in Washington State, you know, I think you should apply for this job at Ohio State. And of course, my response was, are you kidding me? Uh, They're going to be looking for someone who's in their 40s, who's got 25 more years to give to the profession with a lot of experience. I said, Bob, I'm not that person. And he said to me, go ahead, apply anyhow. So I, I applied for the job. 
and in a sense forgot about it because I was just busy doing my work at Washington State. And lo and behold, I think what happened is they went through, oh, five or six people. And I think the job was offered to someone who turned it down. And then they didn't like the other five people. And I think they probably called Bob back and said, well, there's this name that's probably about 15th down on your list. But but you may want to take a look at him. And so that's how that happened. And uh, and it was a tough decision to go to Ohio State because I just loved living in the state of Washington. And I loved teaching in a, in a smaller school like Washington State. There's this thread that's going through the story here about you sort of every opportunity coming to you and you taking it when it happens. And, and I find that really interesting because I think that's the way most people's lives unfold. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, in full disclosure, I, I never, I never thought much about my career. Mm-hmm. I just, I think what happened was, is I worked where I worked, assuming that I was going to be there for a long time, and then I almost backed into every job. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, I, I just think, you know, and I think. I think it's a little bit different today. I think people might be a little bit more concerned with their careers, but that's just the way I thought. So, you know, I, but I was very fortunate because uh, people reached out and, and, you know, every, every one of those new positions was a risk. I mean, going to Ohio state, I think I was 30 years old as the new director of bands at Ohio state. I mean, that was a, a real risk because, had I failed there, I think that would have been my career would have been very, very different. And, mm. and it was a lot of pressure. Um, and again, musically, a lot of pieces that I was doing from the repertoire, I was doing for the first time. Um, so it was, it was a real challenge, but Ohio state, was a place that, that gave me the permission to grow up uh, in a sense as a person and as a musician. And, you know, I made, made mistakes along the way, but I uh, somehow was able to gather enough musical strength and, and wisdom as, as a teacher that I had a wonderful experience there and met wonderful friends who are still lifelong friends. Mm-hmm. How long were you at Ohio State? 14 years. 14 years. And then directly to Minnesota? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I always, well, first of all, my, my family, I grew up in Wisconsin, as you know, and, and so Minnesota is the same cut of cloth, if you will. And I loved growing up. I loved the Twin Cities. There was actually a time in my life that I actually thought about becoming a theater history major. I just found that to be fascinating. Yeah. And Minneapolis, of course, was a big central focal point in the middle of the country for theater. And it still is. And, um, and there's just something about the Twin Cities that uh, was always very attractive to me. So when the opportunity came to go to Minnesota, um, it, it was one that I was was anxious to pursue. So um, I want to return to Tokyo eventually, but let's talk about Minnesota a little bit. What was the program like? And, you know, sort of if you can take me through what that became for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, Minnesota was a school that was primarily known for its composition program. I mean, people like Dominic Argento and Eric Stokes and Paul Fettler and Lloyd Alton and um, and Frank Ben Crescido was the director of bands for 36 years and Frank was you know toward the end of his career and he was not well and the band program just wasn't doing very well because Frank just didn't have the energy that he had in the you know in the middle and the beginning of his career to and you know programs like Minnesota's and other programs demand a lot of energy. And uh, so it was, I saw it as a program that had a great deal of potential. And, you know, I always think there's two kinds of conductors. There's one 
conductor who you know who just wants to conduct the Cleveland Orchestra, and then there's the other kind of conductor who just wants to be, who who loves to build it. And you know, I always love building programs, and there was a challenge in that for me. And the challenge is not only musical; it's you know, it's challenging on a whole you know, on numerous levels. And so I thought, well, I I think that I can create something here and build upon the tradition of the band program, which was a great band program, and and continue this and in a way enhance it in in ways that uh, that maybe I can contribute in a very distinct way. So so the band program, um I think came around fairly quickly and it was with a lot of work and the support of a lot of people. And, and I was very fortunate that some of my closest friends were the faculty members from the, uh, the affiliate faculty members from both orchestras, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and the Minnesota Orchestra. And they believed in what I was doing. And so in a sense, they helped to pave the way to accomplish what I, what I wanted to accomplish. So, you know, it's difficult. It's almost difficult as I look back to think that I, you know, I spent 21 years there as director of bands. And uh, it's funny also looking back through old programs. My Lord, I, I look at programs from 1995 and I can't even remember programming so many pieces. <laughs> but, you know, it was, uh, and also the other thing that was great for me at Minnesota is, because so much of the faculty was involved with the two orchestras, I had to really be a different kind of musician there. I couldn't be just, you know, just the band director type. I had to, I had to be able to speak their language and, 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 and learn how to approach things in different ways. And so that provided the challenge for me that, um, again, was, was another, growth phase in my life and um and you know we did all kinds of things uh you know recordings with faculty members that you know uh i mean famous famous people in their profession and and uh i think one of the ways you, you very quickly get better as a conductor is is to conduct better players to conduct great players because it's an entirely different game so i was just very fortunate again to be in the right place at the right time so I want to kind of go back a little bit. I know I, I, I feel like I should have followed the thread when we were talking about um, um, Fred Fennell and, and the Tokyo Kase. So can you tell me a little bit more about, I know you said that he got you into that, but what was that like, your relationship with that, that band? I mean, it's such a famous group. Well, first of all, it, the experience scared me half to death <laughs> when it first started, because I, I, I can tell you, um, because you know, as as a high school band director and as a college band director, I up to that point I had not worked regularly with professional musicians, and so I can still remember the first rehearsal, um, and we were doing a tour, and the last piece on the program was the entire transcription of the Pines of Rome. And I remember the first rehearsal, and the concertmaster, uh, Sagawa, was very insistent on me that it's very important, you know, for me to read to these pieces so I could get used to them and they could get used to me. And so, I mean, this piece was a part of the repertoire. And so I started the first movement, and we went all the way through, and we got to the end and I thought, Oh my Lord, what am I going to do now? I can play this. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. They can play it. I mean, they just ripped it off. Like it was, you know, like it was nothing. And, and then, you know, of course, you know, I had my own ideas about the music and, and was able to inject that, but you had to make a very quick transition from, I mean, you were still a teacher. You were still a teacher, but but the artistic quotient of that was a big challenge. And the other thing that I realized is that, you know, 
Fred was a great interpreter. He was a great music maker. The one thing Fred did not give them a lot of time was a clear beat. So this group had such a strong sense of independent pulse that as we were going along, I, I would very, I could hear it, hear it very clearly. If I was doing something physically that got in their way, it was like throwing a big chunk of wood into a, a very fine bandsaw, you know? And, and so it was a great experience for me in, in terms of just becoming a better conductor. Sort of in order to get your, your, to exert your will, you had to become better. I can, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. It's like a professional orchestra that, you know, you may have four rehearsals and you're out on tour. Mm-hmm. Yep. So there's no time to talk. There's no time to, plus there's the whole language barrier. So you have to be able to communicate with your hands and with your body. And, uh, so that, that, that really forced me to be a more communicative conductor in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, my own experience with that is watching in the summers, my wife plays at the Eastern music festival and, uh, Gerard Schwartz is the conductor and, and, you know, Jerry gets in those rehearsals and they don't re- really rehearse. They just run it. He says a couple words, they, they do a couple spots and then they're onto the next, you know, they're on the next piece. And they just did like a 50 minute Mahler symphony. You know, it's like, wow. You know, the, just the, 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 the level is so different. Yeah. Well, you know, I, if I have time to tell one story, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting one that puts perspective on this. So my great friend and colleague, David Whitwell, um, actually took a sabbatical and I think, uh, if I remember correctly, was like in residence as a intern with the Philadelphia orchestra. And, uh, so here it is, the first rehearsal of the fall. Um, I think it was Brahms two or something. I can't remember exactly what. But they start rehearsing, and they go almost twenty five minutes without stopping. And and Henry Charles Smith uh, was sitting next to him and leaned over and said. Boy, there's nothing that ruins a great rehearsal like stopping. <laughs> Which is not the way that we think, no, you know, no. as band conductors and as teachers. Right, right. And it finally broke down over, a, I think it was a Boeing thing, David told me. But he's all, he's there with his, you know, pad of paper and his pencil, and he's going to get all the secrets from Eugene Ormandy, and they go for 25 minutes at the first <laughs> rehearsal without stopping. And that's just the difference between the professional world and, and, and our world that we live in most, most days. You talked about score study and having an idea of what the music needs to be in your mind. What's remarkable with those, with those ensembles is how when I watch Jerry Schwartz conduct, and he does go 20 minutes, and then he stops and he goes back to like measure five to make a correction. Something that happened right. like 19 minutes ago, he remembers immediately because it's, it didn't fit and, he, and it stood out to him in such a way. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's a special skill that those professional conductors have because that's the only way they can make it work because what's happening with professional orchestras today is just because of the financial pressures, there's less and less rehearsal time. And so it's not like the old days with George Zell and the Cleveland symphony who would just rehearse things to death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's just not that kind of time anymore. So that's a special skill. That's a very special skill. It's remarkable. Knowing your music, that's for sure. Knowing your music. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, the, uh, that's the number one priority. So while we're talking about this kind of idea about conductor skills, do you have any advice for a young conductor, maybe a band director in their first couple of years who wants to get better, you know, other than going to the summer, summer symposiums, what, what can they do as a conductor? Well, I think they just have to continue growing and learning as musicians and uh, going to other people's rehearsals and uh, watching how that works, going going to professional orchestra rehearsals and getting the sounds in their ears. Um, 
I, you know, there were there were two seismic events in my young career as a conductor that I just wish I would have figured this out earlier. And one was, you know, my high school band that I inherited. I I took to Madison, Wisconsin, and so Bob Reynolds the clinic the band and the. I still remember the repertoire. It was the whole second suite, Trower Symphony, although I don't remember what that sounded like. Um, and then we had three bassoons, so we did American Salute. And, you know, Bob did a wonderful job, you know, clinicking the band. And I learned a lot just watching him rehearse. And then he took me to lunch. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was setting me up. And he he, he would say things like, how do you get them to play that with such great intonation? It's unbelievable, you know, and I, I fill him in a little bit on what we did. And he said, hey, by the way, I just have an old high school band play with this kind of ensemble. And I said, but, you know, we work really hard on this. And he goes on and on. And then finally he looks at me and he said, well, now that you've done all of that, when are you going to be concerned about the music? And it's like life stood still. And what Bob was saying to me is I was only dealing with the objective items of the music making process. And I used to think, well, if I do that, then music is going to magically come forth, which, of course, that doesn't happen. And so it was the longest 90 mile bus ride home because I just realized that I, I had to, that there was something in the way that I was rehearsing that was not working. And, and that's what Bob was telling me. And I think that he wanted me to focus on the music. And I think, I, I think one of the things that got in my way when I was younger is I was afraid of being wrong. And the other thing is, I didn't want people really to know how I felt about the music because I didn't want anyone peering into my soul. And again, I didn't want to be wrong. And so one of the things I would say to younger conductors is, you know, you have to trust your instincts and you have to, you have to study hard and then you just have to believe in what you're doing and how that music has to speak. And that's a big risk because someone may not like it, someone may disagree, but but that's what you have to do. So that that whole experience completely changed my life. And then the other experience was when I was at Ohio State, and about a month, oh, school started, you know, middle of September, and this is about two weeks before our first concert. And I was walking across the Oval to meet a friend at the faculty club, and bunch of students um, from the Wind Ensemble, eh, five or six, caught up with me, and one of them actually had the courage to say, well, Professor Kirchhoff, how do you think it's going? And it's like my life flashed in, in, in front of my eyes because I said to myself, what am I going to do here? Am I going to be honest or just, you know, get, get through this? And I finally decided I'm going to be dead honest. And when I said to them, as well, I'm just really, and I have to put this on my shoulders, I said. this. I, I just, I'm not happy with the progress we're making. I'm not happy with the concentration of rehearsal. We come back to the next rehearsal. We end up having to repair the same things. You know, I went on for a little bit. And, and finally, one of the students had the courage to say to me, well, Professor Kirchhoff, I think, my feeling is is that you stop for everything. And so because you stop for everything, we don't have to concentrate because we know that you're going to repair it. And, and I realized I was doing the same thing with my high school band. In fact, with my high school band, I was always disappointed by the performance performances because they were never as good as I thought they should be or as good as 
what happened in the last rehearsal, and, and I realized that we had never played these pieces through from beginning to end. I continued to nitpick. I continued to correct. I continued. And so with the students at Ohio State, I suddenly realized that I had to give them more responsibility and that I I had to figure out a different way of rehearsing. Um, because, again, these were students at a different level. And, again, it was a painful, painful experience. But I I made that turn. I, I and I started to rehearse differently, and I put more responsibility on their shoulders, and I started to ask more questions. Well, what do you think? And see, I was worried, Mark, about the fact that um, if I didn't stop for things, I was I was afraid that they would think I couldn't hear yeah. or I didn't care. That, those are the two great fears. And that was because of my own insecurities, and it was because of my of my age. So, I mean, every, every young conductor is going to deal with that. But if you, if you study hard and you're committed and you believe in your voice and what you're doing, um, it's going to be okay. I wish someone would have told me all of that, you know, in the early part of my career, but I guess the only way to make real changes is to, is to experience it and realize that, you know, I just have to think differently. I have to rehearse differently. I have to think differently about the entire process. That's such good advice, though. That That's excellent advice. I'm going to ask you one more thing. I'm looking at one of your bios here um, from an article about you, and it says that you have something called the 80-20 rule. And as a beginning band director, I'm really interested in this one. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, my – my sense about this and what I meant by that is that, uh, and I always ask this at, at sessions that I do, and I say, well, how many of you have over-programmed your ensembles? Everybody's hand goes up. And my feeling is, is that if the students, I mean, this is a very general rule. But if the students have to devote more than 20% of their energy on notes and rhythms and ensemble playing, then the piece is probably too hard. Now, it doesn't mean that, and I'm talking maybe about, you know, an entire repertoire for a concert. It doesn't mean that, you know, there's not a project piece there that that's really tough for them. But, but people over-program and they never get to the music because everyone is in survival mode. Everyone is in survival mode. And therefore, who has time to talk about emotion in the, in the music, meaning in the music, and how this might translate to real, our experiences in our everyday lives? There's no time because you're just you're trying to get through the piece. And I, So over-programming to me is, is the great enemy of meaningful music making. And, you know, um, my belief is that students are very perceptive. They're very intuitive. They're very smart. They know, despite what a conductor tells them, when they've either really played the piece or they never quite did it. They, at a certain level, they know. And so, you know, I when I was doing a lot more guest conducting, I, I would tell people that, you know, my goal with the ensemble here is I'm going to stretch them a lot musically and a little bit technically. And because I wanted them to come away with some kind of musical experience where they were transformed by the music and not just so involved in the physical calisthenics of getting through the pieces. And so I, uh, I just think that that 80, 20 rule is, again, it's a rule to be broken. It's not an exact proportion, but it's, it's, it's a general, you know, general, uh, you know, guidepost. 
Hey there, everyone. My name is Anne Molesky, and I'm the host of the Anna Krusik Podcast, another podcast in the Muted Network. It's my mission to help music teachers be more purposeful, sequential, and joyful in each and everything they do as teacher musicians. Join me every Thursday as I share tips, tricks, and meaningful conversations with other music teachers about how to make the general music classroom more intentional and impactful for both you and your students. All right, Craig. So thank you so much for all the time you've given. And I have a couple more questions that I ask all of my guests. And these are big philosophical questions. And um, the first of them is, uh, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Good question. Um, You know, I think that um, in some respects, I mean, if you, you look at what occurs in certain states, in terms of competition and uh, that kind of thing, there's no doubt that competition in and of itself has probably to some extent raised the standard of performance. But the question is, for me, well, I I love this phrase. Uh, There's a wonderful book called Piano Pieces by Russell Sherman. It's He's a pianist at the New England Conservatory, and it's it's really not a piece about playing the piano. It's a it's 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 a book about teaching, and he quotes Bartok in there, and he said Bartok says, "Well, competitions are for horses." <laughs> Interesting comment by Bartok. I think what happens is everything gets skewed out of proportion. And what I become concerned about with ensembles that are preoccupied in an unhealthy way with competition is they they cover very little repertoire. Uh, they play this music way too long, and I think I think the students become numb to all of that. And what happens is when they leave their high schools, instead of having this burning desire to continue making music, I think the reaction of a lot of students who have gone through programs is, I want no part of that again. And I've heard that from students. So I guess my answer is, I don't have a black and white answer because there there is no black and white answer. Uh, But I think, first of all, I, I like to use the expression, What's best for my students? What is best for my students? Not what is best for the band program, but what is best for my students? And and if you can answer that question and answer that honestly, then I think you can keep all of that in balance. But when you go when you go over that balance point, that tipping point, I just think it's not a good experience for students and it doesn't set them up for what I call a, you know, lifelong love affair with music. This is a, an issue that a lot of band directors, music educators struggle with is the idea of work-life balance. Were you able to find a, a work-life balance in your career and do you have any advice for teachers? Well, I'm not exactly the uh, poster child for that. Um, I'm guilty as charged. Um, You know, as I look back on my career, um, I really have no regrets except one, and that is I wish that I would have spent more time with my children when they were younger because I was so busy in the profession, so busy doing what I was doing. And it wasn't that I was a negligent father or anything. I was, I was a great father, but, um, you know, when you, when you deduce everything down in the final analysis, I mean, the most important things in life are our family and our friends. And, um, it's so easy to get in a sense seduced by the profession. And we as teachers are, are by our natural inclination, are givers. We just give and give because that's what we do and that's what our students need. So 
the advice that I, I try and give to younger people, I tell them that story about uh, what I just told you. And I had this experience. I came home. This is when I was at Ohio State, and Monday night was always, you know, faculty recital nights, and I had been gone for about four days. And Jonathan, our younger son, who must have been, I don't know, three at that point, was uh, maybe a little bit younger, was sitting in his uh, high chair, spooning away at his, shoveling in his Cheerios, you know. And and I came home, and, you know, and then all of a sudden I started putting on my call up, and he said, God, where are you going? And I said, oh, honey, I'm really sorry. I know I've been gone, and... And but it it's Dr. Burkhart's trumpet recital tonight. I have to go. And John looked at me and said, "That's really dumb." And then went back to you know eating his Cheerios. And I thought about that for a moment, and I took off my coat and stayed home. And you know, I think there's just it's it's a big it's a big issue for all of us. And what I do tell people is that I think what's important, what was important for me and what's important for them is that they have to find something in their life aside from music that they really love, that they really love to do, uh, some kind of passion. Um, so they're not only identify themselves by what they do, that they have other things in life that make them rich and vibrant and alive and, uh, but you have to take time for that. And uh, so I, I, I just don't have a satisfactory answer, except it's a, it's a continual process, you know, and uh, trying to balance that. And uh, I'm getting better at it. I've, I've learned to say no more often. And now that I'm retired, fully retired from university, there are just things that I don't have to do that I don't want to do, so I don't do them. And it gives me more time. But when you're in the game, when you're in the throes of the cause, it's the whole balance then is uh, it's very difficult. And, you know, I see it with my wife, who I always, I always say to people, my wife is the greatest teacher that I know, and she's an unbelievable high school band director, but I also know how hard she works and the toll that it takes on her in terms of, just creating the balance. It's, it's what we do. It's who we are. So it's, it's the eternal struggle. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. That's why I asked the question. It's, it's, it's a big issue. All right. Yeah. And you know, um, we always joke about, you know, about, you know, someone's tombstone saying, had a great band, really played in tune. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point in life, that's not really important. Yeah, exactly, you know? exactly. There's other things that are important. So. Absolutely. So this is a big question, and uh, everyone takes a sort of different approach to it. But what are the challenges facing music education or band, and, and how can we best meet them? Well, I mean, I think that... Um, First of all, the, uh, you know, the demographics are changing. I mean, what we're finding out is there are, there are certainly fewer students attending the university. There are fewer students going to middle school and high school. It's just what's happening with the population curve. So that's one thing. That's just not the resource of bodies that we can pick from or who who can um, be available to be students um, to join band or to join orchestra or join choir and, and be a part of that. I also think that the challenge, I think, for music education is, is to continue to remain relevant in the development and the, in the growth of the full person, the entire person. And, and I think that because so, so much of our lives is driven by, um, qualitative things. That's why I think assessment has become, or quantitative, I'm sorry. That's why assessment has become so important. And that's why it's so difficult in music because it's difficult to assess if you've moved a soul 
it's difficult to assess how can, how can you really define a student has had a, a genuine transformative music experience. So I, I, I think that our world is becoming more quantitative. And what I worry about is, is I think of all times, at least in my lifetime, where we need to have a, a sense, a greater sense of community and oneness. I think it's now, and and this is this is what I think music does for students. Um, this is what ensembles do. I I know that that a lot of people are very concerned about what happens when we finally crawl out of this pandemic. What's what's going to happen to large ensembles? And uh, I'm just an optimist. I really believe that there's a real genuine need for students or for adults to be a part of something that's meaningful and that you do as a group of people committed to a common cause. I just don't think that's ever going to go away. But I think I think the question will be is how do we remain relevant in the lives of our students. And, um, and, uh, you know, I, I, after all these years, I've really come to believe three things. One is that, you know, every student, and I, 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 you know, I really learned this from my wife and watching her teach because when we, we moved to Minneapolis, she taught in, uh, two elementary schools and, and the first belief is that every student, you know, regardless of their age, has the capacity to be moved by music. Even these little fifth and sixth graders. Um, and the second thing is, is that those students need us as teachers and as mentors to somehow guide them from the love of the activity of being in band or orchestra to the love of music. I mean, you know, I'm sure that in your experience teaching just like mine, it's a rare fifth grader that joins band to have an aesthetic experience. You know, they join it to have fun and to be with their friends, and they've got the shiny instrument that makes interesting sounds. So they need us and our passion and our inspiration to move them from that love of the activity of being in band to the love of music. And then the final thing I, I really believe is that the only way we can do this is by by offering them the best possible music as a part of their musical diet. And that's because that's our curriculum. So, Craig, if I had a time machine and I can program it to the afternoon of your high school graduation, what advice would you give yourself? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, looking back at myself... Um, I think I, w I wish that I would have taken more time to observe and be a part of life's experiences in a sense away from music. I was so directed. I was so motivated to be this great musician that I think I think there are a lot of things in life that I went to the wayside for me because I didn't have the time to investigate those things. So I, I guess that, you know, as I've grown older, I've realized that, well, you know, I become a better musician, not only by practicing more, doing more score study, but by reading more, by spending more time in nature, which is one of the reasons I'm here at the cabin is because I basically we're living here in the wilderness and it's just to observe life is, is, is unbelievable. And, and one of the things that I learned from Frederick Fennell and also Elizabeth Green, who was another mentor of mine was I always admired their curiosity. They were curious people. And I just wish as, at my, you know, at my high school graduation, I would have been a more curious human being. But I was so laser focused on what I thought I should be doing that that it took me a while to understand that 
that whole curiosity factor and being inquisitive about a lot of things in life is, is just really, really important. All right. My next question is uh, another one that gets groans when I ask it, but it's, um, if you had a choice, what would be the final work for band that you'd want to conduct and why? Okay. I'm not going to answer that either. I couldn't give you an answer in all good conscience. Um, um, and that would be a nightmare having to make that choice. But let me just but let me just give you some kind of perspective. Um, my last concert at Minnesota, um, my retirement concert, they called it. Somehow I wanted to book in the concert with two pieces that were really meaningful to me. One was the we started the concert with four movements of the Mozart Grand Partita. Um, and I wanted to end the concert, to bookend the concert with the Holtz for Suite. Because those were two pieces that had great meaning to me. And uh, and then the other, I mean, you know, I was a, what was really important to me is not so much the pieces that I programmed, but the kind of collaborative spirit that was about that concert. So, you know, the second piece on the concert was Sparrows of Joseph Schwanker with Lucy Sheltonson, and who's the woman who premiered it. And I've been very fortunate in my career that I've done that piece three times, all three times with Lucy. But it was just because of that my experience with her as an artistic collaborator, I just had to do that. And then I had, had two great composer friends, James Stephen, James Stevens and uh, Dana Wilson. And I, because they've been such good friends over the years, I wanted to commission them to write pieces. And so I guess that more than finding the one right piece, your last piece is, more a desire to, the goal was to have a, a wonderful collaborative experience with friends and, and artists who had really influenced me. So I know I'm not answering your question, but because uh, there's so many unbelievable pieces and so many composers and, uh, and um, it's like Sophie's choice, you know, it's, it's, All right, Craig, we're kind of in this middle of this strange thing where nothing is happening. And so I usually ask right now, is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? I'll throw it out there. Um, well, you know, it's, uh, it's very strange for me and a lot of my colleagues who are looking at our calendars and we have this wide open expanse of time in front of us because, you know, all of these engagements and clinics and Symposiums have been canceled, but uh, Emily Trinan, who of course you know, is uh, I've been working with Emily and thinking through. Um, she's going to do a virtual workshop in July because I think, yeah, I think you know it's certainly going to be different from a straight ahead conducting symposium, but it, I think it's going to offer a lot to people who. I think are going to feel a real need to connect and be a part of something. So that's what's immediately on the horizon. And um, so I just hopeful that it can be helpful to a lot of people. And uh, if people are interested, they can certainly, you know, go to the website at the university of Minnesota and, and take a look at that. Yeah. I think that, you know, and I think that uh, that's what we do, and I think it's it's just one way for us to accomplish this when we can't be together. And uh, so I'm looking forward to doing that, and I think it'll be a great learning experience for all of us. All right, Craig, how can people get in touch with you? Um, they're, they can certainly, the best way is my, my email, and I still keep my university email address, which is uh, lowercase k-i-r-c-h zero one zero at U M N dot E D U. Craig, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're it. most welcome. I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, I did too. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, enjoy your time up there on the lake. Oh, 
Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, I um, I love uh, being surrounded by nature, and uh, it's great to be able to walk out in the woods. And uh, one of the things is I look out and look at the ridge that is Canada. Life almost seems normal, but obviously it's not. But it's uh, just watching the birds and the squirrels, this coronavirus <laughs> doesn't seem to bother them. So life is still moving on. Yeah, well, stay safe, stay healthy, and um, again, I appreciate you giving me some of your time. You're most welcome. Thank you.